So we'll start though with, with a, a review of factoring. And the reason we're going to review factoring is because factoring involves some of the same sorts of skills as using identities. So what's going on with factoring? Um, what happens here is that we're analyzing an expression and trying to rewrite it as some equivalent statement, which is exactly what we do with identities. Every identity you have on page 92 is just an equivalent way of expressing something else, right? The, the left side of an identity is the equivalent way, is an equivalent way to express the right side. But identities just allow us to rewrite things so that they look different, which is to a large degree what factoring is. All right, so just kind of a review of factoring. If we wanted to factor what I've got on the left side here, we would need to find two numbers that add to negative 2x, or add to negative 2, and multiply to negative 63. Right? The way we can rewrite this is writing it as x minus 9 times x plus 7. Right, that's, that's not an identity. We're not using an identity, but we're analyzing the original expression up here and figuring out an equivalent way to write it, though. Which, again, is 100% what identities are used for. And so back in 171, you, you had a, a couple of special factoring rules. Uh, one of them was called the difference of two squares. I'm going to write down I'm going to write down a, a few of those factoring rules. The difference of two squares, a squared minus b squared. You were told back then that you can factor anything that looks like this, a squared minus b squared. You can factor that into a plus b times a minus b. To, uh, well, one needs to be plus, <laughs> minus, sorry. To a decent degree, this is sort of an identity. In addition to the difference of two squares, you have a difference of two cubes, a cubed minus b cubed. That factors into a minus b times a squared plus ab plus b squared. The third one you saw was the sum of two cubes. That factors into a plus b times a squared minus ab plus b squared. So, you know, these weren't called identities. I'm not saying they are, but I'm saying how we treat these is exactly how we treat identities. And so we needed to factor something like x squared, whoops, minus 81. We would need to, you know, look through this list of, of factoring rules and find the one that matches the format here and then apply what that equation or what that factoring rule says to do which is, again, exactly what's going on with identities. You have to find an identity that works and then apply it properly. So x squared minus 81, that's the difference of two squares. The square root of each of those terms, the square root of x squared is x. The square root of 81 is 9. And so that, that takes the place of the a and the b in our rule. But what the rule says is that we can factor x squared minus 81 into a plus b times a minus b. For again, another example, if we had something that looks like um, x to the third minus uh, eight, we can factor this, right? And I'm, I'm going to go ahead and tell you it's one of our special factoring rules that we're looking at here. Everything we're going to do right now will be. But the task is to find the rule that applies, right? Is this the difference of squares or the difference of cubes or the sum of cubes? Those are our options. It's, it's a difference, obviously, because we're subtracting. But these are both perfect cubes. So to, to apply the rule, we'll take the cube root of x cubed. That's going to be our a term. We'll take the cube root of 8, that's going to be our b term. And then we will apply the difference of two cubes rule. The rule from back here, the second, the second one I wrote, 
says that this factors into a minus b times a squared plus a b plus b squared. Questions about what we're talking about here, right? Eventually we'll make our way to identities. I know this isn't 172 type stuff quite yet, but again, we're, fo we're talking about the skills, similar skills that get used in both places and analyzing an expression, deciding, you know, which of a few scenarios applies and then applying that scenario to the expression is exactly the skills used in working with these identities in 172. Questions about anything we've written here, though? I'm going to scoot it up and write down one more and give you a second to practice, uh, a minute to try this one. Let's try x cubed on plus 64. So this one's the difference, or sorry, the sum of cubes. That's the only one we haven't tried, but I'll give you a second to try factoring this. Apply the factoring rule, if you will. And we'll chat about it in a second. So the task right, is first to identify which of the options, which of the rules applies. We've already established that it. it's the sum of cubes. To actually apply the rule, we need the cube root of x cubed. That's x. And we need the cube root of 64. That's 4. And then we'll do exactly what the rule says. It says a plus b times a squared minus ab plus b squared. So we're rewriting the entire left side of this equation to turn it into the right side. Which one more time and I'll probably quit saying this, but that's exactly the same type of things that work with identities. So we're going to look at one more factoring approach and then we'll scoot over and actually work with some identities that you could have encountered last week and talk about how those are going to come up this week in one in 172 too. Uh, before we look at a, another factoring technique, questions about anything we did here. How are you figuring are you out the 16 and the 4 for the last row? 16. These? The yeah. For both of them? Because I know you, you to get them, you, the it's, 4. It's B squared. So for the one we just did, we're applying this rule and that final term is B squared. And in our case, B is four. So four squared is the 16. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh -huh. And the, I mean, the same thing for the earlier one, the four was in the spot of the B squared, but in that example, B was two. So two squared is Y, so four. Um, okay, so let's 
one of your questions you answered in the survey was about factoring if the leading coefficient is not one. So we talked about what to do if it is one. We talked about these special rules. But what if the leading coefficient is not one? What if we've got something like um, something like this? So from earlier, what we said is we need to find two numbers that multiply to the last term and that add to the middle coefficient. Right, that's that's how we factor the original one x squared minus 2x minus 63. Well, that doesn't work here, but the reason we're not just looking for that relationship is because of this two in the front. It it kind of it messes everything up, at least in the sense of at least in that sense. But an option you have for factoring if the leading coefficient is not one is something called the AC method. So the AC method, A and C refer to the, the coefficients in the equation and the expression. A, B, and C are the coefficients, and the AC method specifically refers to the A1 and the C1. So what we do for the AC method is start by multiplying A times C. 2 multiplied by negative 3, that's negative 6. And what we do with that number, once we get it, we look for factors of it that add to B. So we need to find two numbers that multiply to negative 6 and that add to negative 5. The two numbers that do that are 1 and negative 6. So far, so good. Or questions about anything so far? OK, so what we do once we have those two numbers, we're going to separate that B term using those factors. The 2x squared will stay the same. The minus 3 at the end will stay the same. But instead of minus 5x, what we're going to write instead is plus 1x and minus 6x. And that is absolutely negative 5x, no doubt there. And why we're doing this is because we have a different factoring approach if we have four terms. And right? so what we've done is we've taken this thing that had three terms that was kind of in a more cumbersome uh, situation for factoring. And we've now rewritten it as something that's got four terms, which actually is a whole lot better for us because to factor something with four terms, we can use factoring by grouping. And how the grouping approach works is that we're going to separate, we're going to think about the first two terms as being in one group and the second two terms as being in another. And we're going to take out a common factor from each group. So from the group in blue, we have a common factor of x. So if we take factor out an x from each of those terms, we're left with 2x plus 1. If we look at the green group, there we have a common factor of negative 3. And if we factor that out, we're left with x, uh, 2x plus 1 as well. Questions there? And ultimately, how this wraps up is that the, the two terms outside of the parentheses get for our final line we're going to write them in a group of parentheses on their own and this repeated factor in the parentheses we're just going to write it one time but this is how this is the factored version of our original equation and if you wanted to foil these two parentheses you would get back 2x squared minus 5x minus 3 
the, the whole point of this is to just have a different way of factoring or another option for factoring when that leading coefficient is anything besides one. If it's one, it's, you know, OK enough, we can use the uh, approach from the beginning of the day. If it's not one, it makes things a little more complicated. But this is an option we have instead. Use the AC method to separate into four terms that we can then factor by grouping. Questions there. So just to recap that, I mean, that, that, that will wrap up our factoring conversation. Next, we're going to kind of transition over to the identities that you're that you maybe were looking at last week. Again, the whole point of this is you're absolutely not going to be factoring quadratic equations for 172. Actually, that's not. You'll factor quadratic things, but the quadratic qu equations you look at, you factor won't quite look like this. Um, but factoring involves some similar kind of analysis of an, of an expression that you're factoring, which is similar to what you use for identities. OK, so we'll transition over to actual identity that you would have looked at last week. Again, prerequisite. That's a prerequisite skill for week five in 172 since it was come up, came up in week four. So what you looked at last week were the fundamental identities. And there were six of them. They're on page 92 of the lab manual that bear those top two rows there. Now this is the very first one, sine squared a plus cosine squared a equals one. The thing about that top group of six identities is that you need to know them. You need to have them memorized. They won't be provided on the test. There's a note about that on page 92. They won't be given on the test. You'll need them for the test, but you also need to know them on your own. Most folks don't have a, a huge problem memorizing sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. Right? So that's the very first one. We'll start with that one. But then in, still in that top group, you have two additional identities that are just tend to be a little trickier for folks to memorize. But if you can remember this first one, you can use it to get the other two. So let's say, let's start with sine squared a plus cosine squared a equals one. Let's say we remember that one, but we need to use it to get the other two identities. What we can do is divide all three of these terms by cosine squared a. Sorry, I left the squares off. Divide by cosine squared a. What that does is it creates a new equation, and that new equation is tangent squared a. Sine, over, sine squared over cosine squared is tangent squared. Cosine squared over cosine squared is 1. And 1 over cosine squared is secant squared. So this is actually the second identity from page 92 on the top row. We got it by, I, didn't, I don't have that second one memorized, but I got it from, from knowing the first one. We can get the third one in that top row from the original one as well. Sine squared a plus cosine squared a is 1. If we divide everything here by sine squared a, we get 1 plus cotangent squared a equals cosecant squared a. So not really a, um, you know, a groundbreaking thing, I don't think. Um, you know, if this helps you with memorizing them or with remembering the other two, like that's really good. But it's just a way to convert from one to, from the first one, sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. We can use that to generate the other two identities from that top row so that, you know, at least you're not memorizing three. Memorizing one 
at least for me, I can remember one uh, one of the identities. It's harder to remember three, of course. But if you can remember one, you can use it to generate the other two in that top row. Regarding the, the other three, the three in the second row, I don't have a good tip or trick for memorizing those. Um, those two were that sine of negative A is equal to negative sine A. Cosine negative A equals cosine A. And tangent negative A equals negative tangent A. Not, I don't know, like I said, no, I don't have a real great tip or trick for memorizing those, but um, the cosine is the only one that becomes positive. So generally what I do is memorize, you know, remember that one, cosine negative A equals cosine A. And then by not really memorizing the other two, I just kind of have, have it in my mind that they're going to be negatives. You know, the negative sign comes out to be in front of the trig function. But those were the six you looked at last week. Those are the six fundamental identities. And we're going to practice answering some questions using those um, next. Questions, though, about anything we've said here? OK. So the last thing I'm going to say before we actually do start practicing some of these, I'm going to write down tips. And for folks who are in my class, uh, you already heard these tips. But it doesn't hurt to hear them again, I suppose. So when we're working with these identities, when we're verifying identities, or when we're just simplifying trig expressions, I tend to stick to four tips to recommend as, as we work through them. And the first of those is to write everything in terms of sine and cosine. So if we're starting out with secants and cosecants and cotangents, you know, maybe it'll be a good idea to write everything in, in, in as just sines and cosines. The second tip is if we have multiple fractions, I like to combine them. The third tip is kind of the reverse of that. If we have a single fraction, I like to separate them sometimes. And then the last one is this one really applies if we're verifying an identity, but if you're having to verify an identity, what that means is start with one side of the equation and turn it into the other side. And when you're picking the side to start with, it's uh, my tip is to start with the more complicated side. So those are my four tips. Um, we'll draw back, I'll reference back to these at various points as we're working through these, but here they are. I'll give you, I'll, I'll pause here for just a second if you happen to be writing these down, I'm not sure. But I'm gonna give you some time because once I scroll it up, it's gonna kind of be gone up there. But questions, questions about anything I said or anything I mean from, from something I've written here.
Okay, so let's let's try one. The instructions here are to rewrite this expression to, in terms of just a single trig expression. Right. So we've got <coughs> this fraction. We have a cotangent, a cosecant, and a sine. We need to rewrite this as a single um, trig term. So we'll go through this, and I'm just I'll point out the tips that I've written above and and how they're going to apply. So what I'm going to do first, because I'm you know it's a little easier for me to think in terms of sines and cosines. I'm going to rewrite everything here in terms of sines and cosines. So cotangent is cosine x over sine x. Cosecant x is 1 over sine x. And um, sine x, that's sine x over 1. Right, so write everything in terms of sines and cosines. Uh, the tips, just to point out, they're not in a particular order. doesn't mean you should uh, do tip one first and then the second tip and then the third tip. That's not how it is. They're just general tips for you to keep in mind, for you to consider as you're working through, but not, um, not necessarily do them in any particular order. Okay, so we wrote everything in terms of sines and cosines. What I'd like to do next is working with that denominator. Since I see that there's multiple fractions there, and that is one of my tips, if you have multiple fractions, we can combine them. I'm going to try combining the, the fractions in the denominator. Yes, I'm just, just going to go ahead and recopy the numerator. We're not going to be working with that at the moment, so I'll just get it here and so we don't have to worry with it. But in the denominator, we've got two fractions. And in order to combine them, in order to subtract them, we need to have a common denominator. Between sine x and 1, that common denominator is going to be sine x. The first term already has the denominator we need, which means we don't need to change anything about its numerator. They're both, it's going to stay as the 1. But the second denominator, to turn the 1 into a sine x, we need to multiply the top and bottom by sine x. What we get in the numerator is sine squared x. And the whole point of doing this was so that we could actually combine them in the denominator there. So we get cosine x over sine x divided by 1 minus sine squared x over sine x. So we went through all that hassle. We now have, we we're now able to combine the two original fractions from the denominator. We've now combined them into a single fraction. That's, that's where we've made it. Why is that helpful? I mean, that was one of my tips. Why is it helpful? That's normally a helpful thing to do because uh, convenient things happen when we combine fractions. So I'm going to keep looking. I'm gonna, now that we finished that task, I'm going to kind of switch colors. What the next few things I'll do in red as we work through the next task. But looking at just the numerator here, 1 minus sine squared x, we can work with that. We can use an identity there. I'm just going to recopy the, the top fraction. But we can use an identity for 1 minus sine squared x because 1 minus sine squared x, it's a, it's a rearranged version of that first identity. The very top identity on page 92 is sine squared x plus cosine squared x is 1. If we rearrange that, if we subtract the sine squared x to the other side, we get that cosine squared x equals 1 minus sine squared x. Okay. 
What that tells us is that we can replace the cos, the one minus sine squared x in the in the um, in our current work. We can replace it with the left side of this identity. Right. This is the part that's kind of going back to the factoring rules from earlier. If you, you know, when you find something to factor that looks like the left side, you can replace it with the right side. That's exactly what we're doing here. We have something that looks like the left side. Sorry, the right side, which means we can substitute the left side into our work. Questions there. So that's like the first time we've actually used an identity, but questions about what we did or why we did it or why we can do it, anything at all. What we're going to do next is divide the two fractions. So we actually have now two fractions, one fraction in the top and one fraction in the in the bottom, and we're dividing them, top divided by bottom. To divide fractions, that's not really anything new to 172. That's something you've probably been doing for a while. But to divide fractions, we'll keep the top one the same and multiply by the reciprocal of the bottom fraction. The whole keep change flip thing. And what this does, the signs, the sine x in the bottom and the sine x in the top cancel. The cosine x in the top cancels one of the cosines in the bottom, which leaves us with just one over cosine x, and that's equal to secant x. Which actually now we're done. So all of that, we started with the original expression on the left, we used a whole bunch of substitutions and some algebra, and ultimately we're able to rewrite it as secant x. And that's a big portion of what you'll be doing with, um, with these identities. A lot of rewriting things, but questions about anything we did there? No question. Everything makes perfect sense. Is that fair for me to to think? Makes sense, makes sense to me. Do what? Okay, okay. Yeah, good. I mean, that, maybe it does. I don't, you know, I'm not trying to be funny. Um, these, the reason I'm pausing, though, I'm, some of these things can be tricky. I mean, there's a whole lot of, there's, you know, a lengthy list of work that we did here. Um, we're going to try a couple more. We have a, a, a while still left together. We're going to try to spend the rest of our time talking about these or other ones, you know, stuff like this or other ones that you have. But um, working with identities, don't be my my tip, just kind of my personal tip. I mean, not that I guess these aren't personal, but these my tips earlier were math related. Um, even, you know, as you're getting closer to a quiz or a test or whatever sorts of, you know, upcoming graded items you have in your class, um, make sure to keep practicing these though. You know, that may be seem like a silly and obvious tip, but even if you're, you know, even if you've done a lot that makes sense, don't, don't get content or complacent with it because the more of them you do, the more interesting things about them you'll see. Or maybe even if you were to go back and look at some that you did, you know, if you fast forward life for two or three weeks, if you were to go back and look in two or three weeks and look back at some of the work you had from this week or from last week, you may even look at it and say, huh, what I did worked, but I could have done it better. You know, I could have done it shorter. I could have done it in a more condensed way. And the, the point isn't to do everything quickly or in as few steps as possible, but if you can look back at your work and see that kind of stuff, you know, you're looking at it with a new whatever a new pair of eyes or whatever the cliche is. But if you can look back at something you've done and figure out a way to make it better, that's a you know generally a really good sign that your understanding has, has improved.
from when you originally did the work to whatever point in time that you're looking back and saying, huh, I could have done that better. So absolutely keep practicing these. Like I said earlier today, you're, you'll spend all of this week looking at all of the other identities on page 92. So um, and that that can just get get kind of intense because you're no longer just concerning yourself with the top six, you're concerning yourself with the bottom 30 or however many there are. So finding identities that apply this week is, is likely to be a little more challenging, but your whole point is to find something that does apply. You know, the format of what I need matches the format of this identity so I can use this one. And being on the lookout for that stuff is really important. OK, so I'll get it back to the original size. We'll try try some more. I'm going to give you a chance to try you know, too much. I'm going to give you a chance to try this one. We'll see how it goes. So I'll give you a minute to try that and see if you can rearrange it's the same instruction. So ultimately we want to take this and write it as a single trig term. You want to chat out we can do it together as a group maybe that might be a actually let's do it as a group i was gonna just give you some time but maybe we can just talk through it any so what do you what are some thoughts what are some things we can try so right off, right off that, that there seems there to be the sequence squared x minus one that term on the top of the the, uh, of the fraction Mm -hmm. That can turn into an identity of the tangent squared x is where I started. Yes, so I'm going to, I'll draw that down over here off to the side, but the middle identity, yeah, the middle one on page 92 is that 1 plus tangent squared x equals secant squared x. Rearranging this, moving the 1 to the other side, we can have that tangent squared x equals secant squared x minus 1. What that means is we can replace the entire right side with the entire left side, right? We can just take one out and drop the other one in. That's how the identities work. So secant squared x minus 1, we can replace with tangent squared x. OK. So again, we're not, we didn't write everything in terms of sines and cosines. That was my first tip from earlier. But the tips don't mean do this and then do this and then do this. They're just, again, just, just there for you to consider. OK, so we use an identity. What next might we try? Yeah, I probably I would probably do that next, Michael. Uh, writing everything at some point, I'm generally inclined to write everything in terms of sines and cosines. If I see an identity that I can apply to maybe make this look a little shorter, a little cleaner, I, I will. But at some point, I'm I'm personally I'm almost always going to write things in terms of sines and cosines. So tangent, let's do it for both of them. So tangent squared x is sine squared x over cosine squared x. And secant squared x is 1 over cosine squared x. I think that's a good idea. And what might we do next? Let 
another tip this isn't one of the four either but if you're you know try anything if you are sitting at home and working on these or take a specific surely if you're taking the test and you're not sure what to do just try anything that you know is 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 reasonable is mathematically appropriate to do even if you're not certain it'll help making any you know making a, an appropriate substitution just changing the way the thing looks might you know trigger something in your mind that says oh my gosh now i finally see it you know if you if you're stuck and aren't sure change the way it looks make you know do correct work do correct math but just changing how it looks could be a helpful thing you could see something that you didn't see before but any thoughts on what we're what we can do next here we're two steps away from the end i'll tell you that so we're getting close can you multiply yeah let's do that so we have two fractions one divided by the other top divided by bottom to divide fractions we'll keep the top one the same and multiply by the reciprocal of the bottom that's really great because the cosines cancel leaving us with just sine squared x So we started with this original, you know, in you know, fraction intense, at least more complicated than where we ended. But ultimately, it turned into this bottom thing, which is really kind of cool. We, from our rearranging and our math, we made it look a whole lot nicer. Questions about that one. Okay, I'll scoop that one up. I'm going to copy one more, one more slide like these. And then we'll talk a little bit about verifying identities after this one. So this was just another simplifying. So I'll copy it down. If you want to take a minute to, to try it on your own, we can. I don't know if that's the preference or if the preference is to do them kind of just as a group and work through them together. If anyone has a preference, you can let me know. Otherwise, we'll probably do them together because that's what we've been doing. Let's, we need to simplify this into a single trig expression, a single trig function. Any thoughts on what we can do? Yeah, for sure. So that's, if you ever have operations that are being applied, it's generally a good idea to apply those operations. So if we're talking about squaring that group of two terms, it's generally a good idea to square them or, or whatever the operation is. So let's, let's do that. So we'll FOIL, I'll do them in different colors to kind of help the, keep the work distinct, but we'll FOIL the group in red. If we square that, we get sine squared X, plus 2 sine x cosine x plus cosine squared x. For the blue group, when we FOIL that, we get sine squared x um, minus 2 sine x cosine x plus cosine squared x. So, before we proceed, take a second and make sure you agree with me. There's a lot of a lot of terms in there.
Okay, so what what's next then? Guess we're on the same page with it with this being okay. What can we do next to continue simplifying this? Eliminate? Yeah, for sure. So we have one pair of like terms, the negative two sine x cosine x with the positive two sine x cosine x can cancel, which leaves us sine squared x plus cosine squared x plus sine squared x plus cosine squared x. What's next? We're potentially one step away from the end. But definitely two steps. We could be one step depending on what the next answer is. One, yeah, two, exactly. So this sine squared x plus cosine squared x, it's one. The other sine squared x plus cosine squared x is also one. So all of that simplifies, of course, one plus one, we get two. Which is kind of kind of a crazy thought to me. I mean, not that it's in, insane or anything like that, but it's <laughs> it always seemed kind of... Uh, like magic or maybe like witchcraft, depending on how you view these, uh, that we could take something that, you know, lengthy and, and complex and, and strange like what we started with, and it really just is just the same thing as two. Um, but that's that's really cool. That's how it turns out. Questions? So that one is at least fewer steps. We had to foil that that, you know, complex business at the front, but questions about that one? If not, we'll switch gears and, and look at a couple of verifying identities, but I'm gonna go ahead and ask if you have any questions. I mentioned the last, we'll, we'll spend a, a half an hour or so talking about any questions you have. If you have any questions from anything you you encountered last week or at any other point in the class or from anything you said today, um, feel free to ask that. I mean, you, I think folks have been asking questions along the way, but um, if you have any specific questions you want me to talk about or want me to, to work through, I'm happy to do that. You can put them in the chat if you want to do that, or you can ask them out loud if you want to do that. Um, we'll look at it. We'll, we'll do some verifying identities as long as we want to, but if you have other things to ask, we can definitely do that. So, cosecant at um, theta minus sine theta. This is the first one we'll look at. We need to verify that it's equal to cosine theta times cotangent theta. And so what it means to verify, this is where we actually get to use my fourth tip from earlier. And that fourth tip was to start with the more complicated side of this equation. And the more complicated side, what I mean by that is start with the side that has the most stuff you can do to it. And by stuff, I mean combining fractions, um, separating fractions, factoring, foiling, you know, you name it. But I mean those kinds of things. Like I'm generically using the word stuff. But the more we can do, the more we can apply to simplify, the better. And so in this case, we're going to start with the left side. I see that it has multiple terms. That's good. We can eventually add those if we're able to do that. Um, and that's the cosecant. We can write it as in terms of sine, and that'll be nice. So I'm, I'm going to start there. Cosecant uh, theta minus sine theta. We'll start there. And the first thing I'm going to do is write everything in terms of sines and cosines. I'm going to write this as 1 over sine theta minus sine theta. My cosecant is 1 over sine. The reason I'm doing that, well, so there's no profound, the reason I'm doing that is because I like to write everything in terms of sines and cosines, sorry. But by doing that, that's what I meant to start this with. By doing that, we now have two fractions 
that we can actually combine together. To combine fractions, remember, we need a common denominator. The common denominator between sine theta and one is going to be sine theta. The first denominator already is what we need. That means we don't need to change its numerator either. But the second denominator, we need to multiply the top and bottom there by sine theta. And that gives us sine squared theta in the numerator. The whole point for doing this is to get to get it so that we can actually combine those fractions, though. Since the denominators now match, we can combine the numerators. And now what? Any thoughts? Are you able, Are you to, able to eliminate one of the sine signs from that? So it's one so minus it's sine and sine. No. We, so what you're talking about would be the same thing as eliminating this three. Well, let me make it minus. Is eliminating this three. But we can't do that. You cannot eliminate terms. You can eliminate factors. So if we had seven times three over three, yeah, we can mark those out. But we can't do it from up here because seven minus three over three, that's four thirds. But if you eliminate them, you might come to the conclusion that it's seven, which is wrong. So if you're talking about eliminating a term, no. If it were multiplied, though, certainly. What we can do, I think Michael wrote in the chat, yeah, 1 minus sine squared, that's the same thing as cosine squared. We, we used that one earlier. So the entire numerator there, we can rewrite it as cosine squared theta over sine theta. Keep in mind, I'm going to point us back to where we're trying to end up. We need to have a cosine theta and a cotangent theta. To get there, we're going to use my third tip from earlier. I believe it was number three. We're going to separate this current fraction into two fractions. Cosine squared theta over sine theta can be rewritten as cosine theta over one times cosine theta over sine theta. If you make sure you agree with that, if you don't, let me know. It's okay if you don't, we can talk about it, but just make sure that that's okay with everybody that we've done that. And the, okay, the whole reason to do that is Again, kind of glancing back up to where we need to be. We've, we're actually there now. Cosine theta over one, that is cosine theta. And cosine theta over sine theta is cotangent theta. So we've made our way. We started with the left side. We made these series of substitutions and used some identities. But we've made our way to the right-hand side, which is how to verify an identity. We have verified that the left side is equal to the right side. Questions about that one. Can we do? Yeah, sure. That was from the homework, um, specific, uh, particularly. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. 
Um, so I'm gonna copy. Make sure I'm copying. Or I can just read it out loud. Um, no, no, no. I mean, no. I mean, this is fine. What you've got. I just want to make sure I'm writing what it is. Sine squared. So I should write it. Neat. Sine squared x minus cosine squared x over one minus cotangent squared. This is what it is, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, so we need to start with the left hand side and try to turn it into the right hand side. Um, so, well, so I said we need to start with the left hand side. We should start with the left hand side because there's this is the more complicated side, right? Comparing what's here on the left to what's there on the right, there's undoubtedly more stuff we can do on the left side. So let's start there. I'll recopy that and we'll get going. While I'm doing that, what think about some things we might try. Any thoughts on what we could where we could start? The numerator sine squared x minus cosine squared x is equal to one based on the identities. Not equal to one. Cosine squared plus cosine squared is one. The identity we don't have an identity for a minus. Not with sine and cosine. Can you multiply by the conjugate? Whoa, okay, you can. Um, that's, have you encountered that? Why are you saying that? Have you done that before? Um, I went on YouTube uh, when I was trying to do this problem <laughs> and uh, got that tip, so. That's a tip. I generally stray away from that because it's not a very popular, it's not a very common one. Uh, you I, used to, I used to give uh, six tips and I've narrowed it, I've whittled it down to okay. four because some of them, you, well, I don't. Um, I mean, it was pretty messy with can. the conjugate. Uh, admittedly, I just I, I was just looking at my work, and that's what my best shot was. Okay. Or I one see. of them. The other one was um, I uh, I put cotangent at, uh, squared x and I uh, switched it to cosine squared theta over um, sine squared theta, and then um, can I multiply the top and bottom? Ted, this that. was your question. Are you, is it, um, have you, is this definitely copied correctly? Like, there's no doubt. I mean, like, you oh. have, like it's for sure that yeah, you sent so me the right the, equation. Yep. Yeah. Okay. The other part of the question was like, this may not be equal. It may not be true. <laughs> okay. Um, and it wasn't, um, true, but it, yeah, the correct it doesn't one look is, like it's going to be. Yeah. Um, so sine squared theta is what it is uh, true for. Uh huh. So I didn't know, you know, why that was the case. Yeah, I mean, we're gonna. It's just a good like I when I'm I, normally I, if you're when you're recopying things, I always say make sure you copy it correctly too, because that yeah. If you're trying to verify these and you copy it wrong, it's gonna be a hot mess. But I'm gonna go back to something Logan said for a second. Um, be very careful about sine squared x minus cosine squared x. There's a, a large tendency or a common tendency. For folks to put one there, it's not one. So just, you know, be careful not to do that. It's really easy to try, you know. Um, but the identity is for sine squared x plus cosine squared x. Not to, of course, not to single out, single you out, Logan. That's a really common thing, and I just wanted to make sure to go back and, and point it out. Um, the bottom does not equal cosecant squared x. The identity is. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, right. It would be plus if we were doing cosecant. So another, again, it's really common to get into these. When you're looking at those top three identities, the signs S-I-G-Ns are super important. If you overlook a sign, you might replace an identity that doesn't belong. So um, based on what's here, I, there, I don't see off the bat, I don't see an identity we can apply. So what I'm going to propose is that we write the denominator and we rewrite everything in terms of sine and cosine. So let's, we'll start off there. Um, that's gonna be one minus, 
cosine squared x over sine squared x. Not everything in terms of sines and cosines. I don't know if it's going to be helpful. I said that before. You know, I when I see new equate new identities to verify, I'm honestly you know trying things that may or may not work. Hopefully they will. But you know, sometimes you just try things and see what works out. Okay. So we've done that. What else that we've talked about might we do next? Here's a hint. Multiply by the LCD. Get an LCD, get a common denominator to combine the fractions. Right, anytime we have two fractions like that, combining them is often a, a cool thing to do. So we'll keep the top the same, but we're going to work on getting a common denominator down there in the bottom. The common denominator between 1 and sine squared is going to be sine squared. To turn the 1 into sine squared, we should multiply the top and bottom by sine squared x. That gives us sine squared x over sine squared x. The second denominator already is what we need, so its numerator is going to stay the same, which is really cool. We can now combine those fractions. I'll wrap that process up in red. We get the single fraction sine squared x minus cosine squared x over sine squared x. What's next? Multiply by the reciprocal. Yeah, we have. So we're dividing the the stuff in the top by everything in the bottom. And so to divide by a fraction, we multiply by its reciprocal. That's going to be sine squared x minus cosine squared x as a group multiplied by mm -hmm. sine squared x over sine squared x minus cosine squared x. And what happens next? Distribute the sine squared x. Don't, no, don't do that. Something oh. even, I mean, that's fine. Not, that's not wrong. I mean, it's, you can totally do it, but something else. Oh, um, just uh, cross out numerator and denominator, the common. Yeah, yeah sorry. I wasn't even looking. So that gives us sine squared x, which is why it's, that was what we we're trying to get right. is to see if it's true and it's not. Questions about anything we did there. And um, I don't mean to hog up the whole time, but I just have one more verification, one that may be helpful for everyone. I know I struggled with it on the homework. Yeah, what's up? Tell, go for um, it. So I can just say this one. Um, it's uh, cosecant theta plus cotangent theta over tan theta plus sine theta equals cosecant squared theta. Yeah, that's right. OK. And that was also false. Also false. OK. Um, again, the, the tip for these identities is start with the left, start with the more complicated side. In this case, that's the left side. So I'll just recopy that to get us started. Um, 
thoughts? What should we try? Uh, yeah, that's what Michael wrote is always the favorite of my things to start with. If I'm not certain what to do, there's no <laughs> identities that, that readily apply. Um, so uh, switching it in, in terms of sines and cosines is something I'm generally a fan of. So cosecant is 1 over sine, cotangent is cosine over sine. Uh, tangent is sine over cosine. And sine is sine over one. Cool. Next. On the top, can we combine the fractions and it would turn out to be one plus cosine theta? Yep. So, um, I'll do that in red. We get one plus. Since the denominators match, we have no reason not to go ahead and combine those. We'll save some space, and I'm going to go ahead and say, hey, let's do the same thing in the bottom. We just need to get a common denominator first. Between cosine theta and one, the common denominator is cosine theta. The first denominator already is what we need, so the numerator stays the same. But the second denominator, we need to multiply by cosine theta in the top and bottom. Um, uh, not what I was hoping we were going to get, but we get cosine theta sine theta. I guess that'll work out okay. So that eventually and, and next we can combine those as well. So the numerator we keep that that's already done. In the denominator we now have um, sine theta plus cosine theta sine theta all over cosine theta. OK. There's all of that. What's next? Might try. Multiply by the reciprocal. Yeah, and uh, you know, is it going to work I, again for some of these things is what you try the right thing the you know in that moment too? i don't know but it's one fraction over another we can at least do that so the top one will keep the same we'll multiply by the reciprocal of the bottom um, What next? Distribute? No. Oh, I mean, uh, just like uh, not distribute, uh, but well, I guess that's basically, I was just going to say multiply across, but um, yeah. Uh. So I've, I've highlighted or underlined the, the second denominator there. We're actually going to factor it in there oh yeah one plus cosine or uh so 
So, so in that second fraction, whoops, sorry, the second denominator, we can factor out each of those. There's two terms in there. One, two. They both have a common factor of sine theta. So we can factor out a sine theta from each term. What that does is allow us to cancel this entire numerator with the entire factor from the other denominator. And we get cosine theta over sine times sine is sine squared theta 